Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Charles C. Shaw speaking. KTSA is honored this evening by the presence in our studios of two great men, the Honorable H.G. Wells, world-famous British historian, author, and student of world affairs, and Mr. Orson Wells, the genius of stage, screen, and radio. This is the first time that Mr. H.G. Wells and Mr. Orson Wells have appeared together. In fact, they met for the first time only yesterday here in San Antonio. But this is not the first time that their names have been linked. Two years ago, Mr. Orson Wells adapted Mr. H.G. Wells' book, War of the Worlds, for radio purposes, and you know the rest. Revising the story somewhat, Mr. Orson Wells depicted an invasion of the United States by men from Mars. Although he explained it numerous times during the program that it was fictitious, the country at large was frightened almost out of its wits. Men called radio stations, offering to enlist against the Martians. Others were panic-stricken. The realism of the production, frightening though it was, was a tribute to Mr. Orson Welles' genius. And thus the name of Wells, H-G-W-E-L-L-S and Orson W-E-L-L-E-S, became linked. Mr. H.G. Wells, in the opinion of many, is the world's most famous man of letters. He has come to San Antonio to address the United States Brewers Association, and Mr. Orson Wells is here for a town hall forum address Wednesday. In this meeting of great minds, I feel rather inconspicuous, and the less I have to say, the better you listeners will like it. But first... Could I interest you gentlemen in a discussion of Mr. Orson Welles' broadcast of Mr. H.G. Wells' book, The War of the Worlds? You're turning the meeting over to us, sir? I am for the moment. <laughs> He's turning it over to us. Well, I've had uh, uh, a series of the most delightful experiences seemed to, since I came to America. But the best thing that has happened so far is meeting my little namesake here, Orson. I find him the most delightful uh, uh, carrier. He carries my name in an extra E that I hope he'll drop sooner or later. <laughs> See no sense in it. And uh, I've uh, known his work before he made this sensational Halloween uh, spree. <laughs> Are you sure there was such a panic in America, or wasn't it your Halloween fun? <laughs> I think that's the nicest thing that, a, mm. that a, a, a man from England could possibly say about the men from Mars. Because mm. uh, uh, Mr. Hitler made a good deal of sport of it, you know, and sp actually spoke of it in the great Munich speech, you know. Mm. And there were floats he, in Nazi parades. There wasn't much showing. else to say. That's right. <laughs> there wasn't much else to say. <clears throat> and it's supposed to show the corrupt condition and decadent. Uh, uh, state of affairs in democracies, that the War of the Worlds went over as well as it did. I, I think it's very nice of Mr. Wells to say that uh, not only I didn't mean it, but the American people didn't mean it. I, that was our impression in England. We had articles about it, and people said, have you never heard of Halloween in America when everybody pretends to see ghosts? <laughs> mm. Well, the... Uh there was some excitement caused. I uh, really can't uh, belittle the amount that was caused, but I think that the people uh, got what, over it very quickly, don't what you? What kind of excitement? Mr. H.G. Wells wants to know if the excitement wasn't the same kind of excitement that we extract from a uh, practical joke in which somebody puts a sheet over his head and says, boo, I don't think anybody believes that that individual is a ghost, but we do scream and yell and, and rush down the hall. Mm -hmm. And that's just about what happened. That's, that's a very excellent description. You, you aren't quite serious in America yet. <laughs> you haven't got the war right under your uh, chins, and the consequence is you can still uh, play with ideas of terror and conflict. You think that's good or bad? It's a natural thing to do until you're right up against it. So it ceases to be a game. And then it ceases to be a game. Well, now, uh, here's a thought. Some of Mr. H.G. Wells' writings are termed fantastic, and a few years ago, well might they have been conceived such. The shape of things to come, which told of a long internecine war, was such a fantasy. But, Mr. Orson Wells, do you think that it's so fantastic in view of today's events? It certainly is not so fantastic. And the, the one question that Mr. Mr. Wells has uh, spoken of, not only in the shape of things to come, but has uh, hinted at or directly prophesied a... Uh, such a state of affairs following a, uh, a wasting war and a return to a feudalism from which uh, the world would find itself again. And uh, today in Mr. Wells' lecture, he said uh, quite the most interesting thing that uh, 
uh, I've heard in a long time. He said that he commenced just recently to ask himself if there was any reason why mankind should so uh, uh, emulate the phoenix and should so uh, get itself out of uh, its mess. He proposed a couple of, uh, of uh, solutions, but he did admit that there that there was a possible excuse for a gloomy point of view, mm -hmm. and that it would be good to be realistic about it and not to uh, dismiss the gloomy point of view anymore. Perhaps uh, uh, the time had come to look ahead, since the future, uh, Mr. Wells's future, which we've always adored and never uh, really understood, is suddenly upon us. Mm -hmm. And we are living right now in that uh, famous H.G. Wells future, which we all knew about. Now, before we get away from this microphone, tell me about this film of yours that you've been producing. Uh, your producer, aren't you? Your right. art director, your everything. Well, Mr. Wells. What's the film called? It's called Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane, yes. Citizen. Not C A I N. No, K A N E. And this Kane. is, of course, the kindest, oh, yes. the most gracious possible thing to do. Mr. Wells is. Uh, making it possible for me to do what in America is spoken of as a plug. <laughs> and uh, he understands do this fine old American I don't stuff. understand these words. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, you understand the, uh, uh, the value, however. Mr. Wells wants me to tell you that uh, I am, have made a motion picture, and he is kind enough to ask me a leading question concerning it. I am looking forward to it. <laughs> You're very kind, sir. It's a, it's a new sort of motion picture with a new uh, uh, method of presentation and a few new uh, technical uh, uh, experiments, a few new new uh, methods of telling a picture, well, not only from the point of view of writing, but of showing it. If I don't uh, misunderstand you completely, I think there'll be a lot of jolly good new noises in it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I think a few jolly good new noises are what the motion pictures could... Stay, could uh, Oh, well afford these days. I, I hope you're right, and I hope there are some jolly good new noises. I can think of nothing more desirable in motion picture. I'm all for some jolly mm -hmm. good new noises. Well, wasn't it you, Mr. Orson Welles, that uh, presented for the first time in modern times plays without scenery and settings in your That's Julius right, Caesar? That's right, yes. And they, well, they were not... Well, the, no, uh, there's no yes. such thing as a play without settings, because there's no. got to be something behind an actor, and you've got to look at something. Very simple settings. I... I had an extraordinary experience once. I saw uh, uh, Ellen Terry's son. What was his name? Ellen Terry's son? Yes, you mean his a... production of Hamlet. You mean Gilgood? Uh, no, no, no. Gilgood is a relation of the Terry's. No, no, no. Um, but... Never mind his name for the moment, but I saw Hamlet produced in Russian in Moscow. Oh, the Stanislavski production? Was no, there? no, the... Uh, uh, this I know nothing about. I, I'm sorry. Awfully well, sorry. Yes. And that was done with screens, don't you know, That's and right. nothing else. And it was done in Russian. I know my Hamlet pretty well, and all the time I thought I was listening to the English play. Do you understand that? yes. Yes. Mm. That was a great show. Yes. Mm. What do you think the effect, uh, what effect do you think this war, or any war, will have or is having on the arts, principally the theater and uh, literature? Well, now, in a country that is fighting hard, as Britain is doing, the arts go into a temporary rest. Uh, they, uh, but I think if we come out of the war, then there will be a great renaissance because we shall have a greater sense of reality less uh, respect, don't you know, for tradition and the uh, old-fashioned way of looking at things. Oh, I agree so much. I think it, may, it means... If Great it purge, I if think. If it doesn't war. mean disaster, this war, it may, means a tremendous renaissance of the human mind. And a new approach to realities in, in terms of the arts. Of course, now in America we go through the worst possible stage in the arts because we are not ourselves engaged in the war, and the war is, is only a kind of conception in the newspapers for us. But it has affected us sufficiently to degrade the taste, and we're going through that, that period in, during, of, of uh, mild war hysteria, which means the degradation of standards 
in the arts, particularly in the theater arts, but a, a tremendous boom in the financial aspects thereof. As if people are rushing into the theaters, but they're rushing into the wrong theaters to see the worst kind of path. Mm -hmm. uh, after we get into the war, and if we do, and after we get into uh, uh, the kind of trouble that we're bound to get into if it isn't precisely the war that we're speaking of now, since the war becomes a new war every week. But after we get into whatever it is we're going to get into, the same thing will be true of us, I think. And uh, our arts will go into uh, a temporary decline. But again, uh, any sort of success following this war must make a whole new uh, approach to the arts possible. It's always a great purge, I think, in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the visual arts and in the theater arts, particularly in letters. What happens to our democratic peoples is first is the shock. Yes. And mm -hmm. then after the shock, they pull themselves together. Mm -hmm. And we've had the shock, and now I hope we're going to pull ourselves together. And that means politics, war, uh, art, everything become more rational, more powerful. We should take a step forward, unless we take a step backward and go over the precipice. Do you think that that shock is due to a lack of discipline in a democratic country as opposed to a totalitarian country? Oh, no. Uh, oh, good. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so great. Uh, discipline is a word for children and... Uh, you know, people who have to salute and that sort of thing. Grown-up people do want to live freely and largely. Therefore, any group of gangsters who get together and give themselves wholly up to getting power have a temporary advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been through the whole of this thing on a small scale with... Uh, uh, your your gangsters here who had for a time a reign of terror. They terrorized. And a very districts. real discipline within their own ranks. Yes. Yes. Discipline they is the word. Mm -hmm. Law of the pack. Fear discipline in their own uh, ranks. But directly your democracy said, this is too serious and we can't let it go at that. You dealt with them. We have to deal with this air assault on civilization now, because it all comes through the air, you know. Mm -hmm. And until we've got a world control of the air, this sort of thing may come back again. That's the thing that we have to stop. Well, do you think that uh, this uh, faculty that makes people get shocked, this trait that makes them get shocked, is a sign of adulthood as compared with a more childlike attitude on the part of those who are under totalitarian I, rule? I think adult people want to live their own lives try experiments with life, do this and that and the other thing, and therefore any sort of criminal who chooses to uh, concentrate on terrorism gets a temporary advantage. And you can't cure that. The grown-up world uh, is at the mercy of the criminal until you've developed a method of dealing with the criminal. a method can be developed. Naturally, there's a momentary period of surprise, because we're not, by the very nature of our way of life, we're not equipped to deal uh, with what is foreign to our conception of a way of life, so that the, uh, the first shock must necessarily be very great. Mm -hmm. If you have a happy village of people doing this, that, and the other thing, and you get a dangerous lunatic who begins to go about terrorizing the whole village, it's a great nuisance, but you have to pull yourselves together and suppress that lunatic. That's what civilization has to do now. And for a because moment, speaking of your business as a shark, for a moment, of course, there is a, everybody is merely appalled. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and during that period of, of, uh, of uh, mere uh, shock and mere terror, uh, the criticisms against democracy sound very valid indeed. But uh, we know that... Uh, Mr. Wells's community is going to uh, pull itself together and going to deal with this lunatic. Well, do you think, Mr. H.G. <clears throat> Wells, that Britain's reverses, early reverses, may have been due to that initial period of uh, shock and that now they're over I it? I think that our people 